heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 166, covering the week of April 22nd through April 26th, 2019. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. Give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook and you'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and a weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Also, go out to abbevilleinstitute.org and at the top of the page, you'll see a button that says support. Click on that, and you'll see a little drop-down menu. One will say shop. If you go out to that shop button, you can get all of your Abbeville Institute apparel. It's embroidered, nice stuff. You've got golf shirts, hats, all kinds of cool stuff. Golf towels. It is it is spring, summer. We just had the Masters Tournament, so it's a great Southern tradition, golf. And so go out and get your golf towels. I mean, it's great stuff. Also, you can, under that uh, button that says support, you can drop that down. And you've got our donor options. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time donation. We do exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like this podcast, and you like our website, and you like our conferences, and all the things that we do, and we've got other things we're working on behind the scenes, are just not out there yet. We've got a lot of cool stuff going on right now. Um, you're going to want to donate to the Abbeville Institute. It does help us do all of these wonderful things. Also a reminder that our summer school is coming up in July. Uh, it is the last week of July, I believe. Let me check on the calendar here. It is July 21st through 26th, 2019. It's in Seabrook Island, South Carolina. The topic is the New South and Reconstruction. Space is limited, uh, so you want to contact Dr. Livingston as soon as possible so you can get in on that. It's a great time. It's not just a stuffy conference with a lot of stuffy lectures. It is also a vacation for a lot of people at the beach. I mean, it's right, it's beachfront property, so it's it's a great place. You're going to want to go down there and enjoy the summer school, enjoy the camaraderie, enjoy the lectures. We've got a lot of good material this year, so hopefully you can make the time. If you are a student, whether you're an, a, a high school student, college undergraduate, or graduate student, or maybe you're in the seminary, or maybe you're a law school student, we would enjoy to have you there. We do have scholarships available. So again, contact Dr. Livingston. All that information is available on our website. Going out to abbevilleinstitute.org. And uh, the in the middle of the page, it'll say you're invited. Click on that link and you go on out to it. A couple other things. Don't forget to download our mobile app. Just go to your app store, whether it's on uh, it's Apple or, or Samsung, whatever device you're using, it's Google Play. Whatever it is, go to our app store. Just do a, a search for Abbeville Institute and you get our free mobile application. So you have the Abbeville Institute on the go. Uh, and uh, when you do, of course, subscribe to this podcast on, on uh, uh, Apple Podcasts. And when you do, rate the podcast. You know, the better ratings, the, the better we do. So go on out there and rate that podcast. Okay, all that said, let's talk about the week that was at the Abbeville Institute. And uh, one of the things I like about the material this week, first of all, the first article this week is by Richard Weaver. And um, I want to say for us for a minute, uh, before we get into that, of course, we had the passing of Aaron Wolf from Chronicles Magazine. Aaron was a great supporter of the Institute. He spoke at um, a conference of ours just last year on, on Robert E. Lee and the Southern tradition. And so it's, it's a supreme loss that, uh, that Aaron has, has left this world. And of course, he, um, he leaves behind a, a wife and, and six children, and he was only in his mid-40s. And so... Uh, it's a great tragedy that uh, that Aaron Wolf has has passed away, and uh, we offer our condolences here at the Abbeville Institute. And um, if you are a supporter of Chronicles Magazine, uh, you'll probably be receiving some information about that. If you would like to contribute to help out Aaron's family, uh, there will be some information about that coming from Chronicles. So um, look for that. Uh, but uh, a, a great loss to the uh, paleoconservative side of things. I mean, Aaron was a true Christian gentleman a man who was very much interested in tradition, in the Southern tradition, uh, in the Christian tradition, Western civilization. He was an important uh, pillar of paleoconservative thought and a young man as well. So uh, it is a great loss to our side. Uh, I, I will say this. Um, I, I believe they were working on something with Richard Weaver. but And so I say that to bring in Richard Weaver, who also died far too young and uh, in, in, uh, left, uh, left this world uh, still with a lot of work to do, but 
Uh, Richard Weaver is one of the pillars, a paragon of paleoconservative thought, and uh, and he was a, an, a tie to the agrarians. And so uh, Weaver produced a lot of good work in the 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, he is um, one of those individuals that if, if we still have, if we had a, you know, a, a pantheon of, of Southern thinkers in the 20th century, he would certainly be in that group along with, of course, Mel Bradford and Clyde Wilson, uh, also the agrarians. So there is a... a um, a need to read Richard Weaver. If you haven't read Richard, we- Richard Weaver, of course, you can get a lot of his essays. Uh, there's the Southern Essays of Richard Weaver, which is published by Liberty Fund. I would highly recommend picking up that book. There's also uh, his, his uh, large In Defense of Tradition. It's a collection of essays, which is not just on the South, but on uh, tradition in general. So a uh, great collection of essays. But the essay that we published on the website was actually in a book. Uh, we ran the first essay in it, uh, in this book, uh, last week by Louis Rubin, and uh, this particular essay is entitled The South and the American Union. It's in the book The Lasting South, uh, edited by James uh, Kilpatrick, and um, this book came out in 1957. It was published by Regnery, and so uh, we published the essay here because I think that what he does, and we have a a couple other pieces that deal with this particular topic this week, and what, what Weaver does so well in this particular essay is highlight the differences between the North and the South that were apparent in the colonial period moving forward and how the South fit in that American Union. And it's not just climate and geography and the things, labor institutions. These are the things that all historians, well, the South was agricultural and the North was industrial. Uh, the, the South had great long growing seasons where they could grow cotton and tobacco and the North didn't. Uh, and so the South had slave labor and the North had free labor. And so you look at these surface issues But what Weaver gets into, and he does very well, are the philosophical and theological differences. And we have a piece on Tuesday that also gets into these theological differences. But I think you can't understand the South. You can't understand the South or the Southern man without understanding the mind of the South. And this is something that Eugene Genovese did very well um, when he looked at the mind of the Old South. I mean, look, ideas have consequences. People are not just simple automatons. They don't just go out and work. There's a reason why. I mean, and tradition in the South means something. And the South, I mean, the, the old question is the chicken and the egg. Was Southern culture created by the institutions of the South or did the, South, or the Southern mind create the institutions? How did that work? And so I think it's important to get to that. It's important to understand that. The Southern Southern institutions were created by the culture of the South, which, of course, was transplanted from a certain portion of the British Isles. If you read David Hackett Fisher, Albion Seed, you get that. So it's important to understand this, uh, where the Southern mind and the Southern man comes from. And Weaver does a very good job of doing that. And he actually points out the difference between North and South. It's a mindset more than anything else. It's a way of looking at the world. One is more imperialistic. That's the North. They're busybodies. They can't just leave anything alone. They have to always be doing something, and eventually that leads to reform and other things. There's, uh, there's always something to irritate them. That's the Puritan mind. They're irritated by something that has to be fixed. Something in society has to be mechanically fixed. So if it's a social institution, you have to fix it. If it's a political institution, it has to be fixed. And uh, I love the bumper sticker. Um, you know, uh, if if it ain't if it ain't broke, government will fix it till it is right. And that's but the the government part isn't really the important part. It's the it's the Yankee, the Puritan will fix it till it is. If it ain't broke, the Puritan or the Yankee will fix it till it is. Because in their mind, of course, this is idealism, it goes all the way back to Plato's theory of forms. But it's idealism. You have the ideal, and if that ideal doesn't mesh with the reality, well, then you have to fix it till it is that way. Southerners have never really been interested in that. What they have in their mind, when they look around the world, and Alan Harrelson gave a great talk on, in this way at our last summer school when he was talking about music and gospel music and how gospel music and viewing the world, um, how it was representative of the Southern worldview. Southerners are aware there's no perfection unless it's reality, right? which has all of its pitfalls and, and, and things that are wrong. But that's actually a, 
a perfection in a lot of ways. They're looking around. They're saying, you know, it's Hank Williams. If heaven ain't a lot like Dixie, I don't want to go. And of course, that, that's the old gospel view of the world around them. And when you even go back to the colonial period, and you start talking about how Southerners who would become Englishmen who would become Southerners, how they sold the area they were going to. It was a beautiful place, a bounty. Northerners just tolerated where they were. It was horrible. Who want to live in New England? It's cold and miserable. But the South was warm and lush, and you could use it. You could use it in a way that would that would facilitate God's perfection. God's utopia, right? And I mean, it's there's no perfect place. Why Sir Thomas More called utopia, utopia. It's a Latin term means nowhere, utopos. But the, the idea that the South was something to be loved and cherished. And you find this a worldview. You find that the Southerner is not a busybody. They're just going to sweep around their own back door, their own. They're going to worry about themselves and they're going to worry about their family. They're going to worry maybe about their community and and uh, you know, trying to make sure that that's OK. But I mean, beyond that, they don't really care what happens in New England. Uh, there's a great <laughs> one of the funniest things I ever heard. Uh, well, it's indirectly that Clyde Wilson ever said uh, was that he gave a talk. And he talked about how a bunch of students in Washington State were agitated by some things going on in the South. And, uh, you know, they, they think about the South all the time. And he said, you know, we can, Southerners can go a, a, a whole month, a year, maybe even a lifetime without even thinking about what's happening in Washington State. And this is true. They don't really care what happens in Washington State. We could care less about what goes on up there. But they're going to worry about what goes on down here all the time. Uh, I, I remember back uh, when there was this you know, controversy, and of course Calhoun is now under attack at at, at uh, Clemson University. Clemson University, his his school essentially. I mean, this is his plantation. His home is right in the middle of. The, so we're going to take Calhoun off the honors college because some busybody faculty member there has decided to make this an issue, a busybody, because they don't know anything about Calhoun and how important he really was. All they know are slogans and platitudes. So the busybody's running around trying to get their students, and they put up signs, and, oh, Claire Calhoun's there. They do all these things. And uh, I remember um, uh, back uh, when, when Calhoun was removed off of, off of Yale College there, in Yale University, there was Calhoun College. They removed Calhoun off of that at Yale. And some busybody from Yale came down to Alabama. And, uh, of course, in Alabama, you have um, Calhoun all over the place, particularly in some of the colleges. And he went to one of the colleges, and he talked to... Uh, Talked to some people there, and of course they they basically didn't want to see him. You know, just get out of my office. They don't want to talk about this stuff because they got better things to do. That's busybody nonsense. But he talked to a student, a little uh, a little African American girl, and he said, "You know, are you upset about the name of this college? I mean, Calhoun's on it." And she looked at him and said, "Are you serious? There's people in in at Yale that have nothing else to do." But worry about what names on the college. I got things to do. I'm trying to get an education here. I'm trying to learn so I can do. I can better myself. Just basically shut this little busybody from New England down, because he was coming down here to try to raise a ruckus. And she just told him, "I got better things to do than worry about what's on the college. That doesn't affect me at all. I don't care what names on the building. I want to get an education and get out there and do something better for myself." That was the epitome of the Southern mindset. You see, it doesn't matter about race. Or, it's the Southern mindset. We are going to get along, we're going to go along, and we're going to try to improve ourselves and not really worry about a whole bunch of other stuff because it doesn't really matter. And Weaver points that out very well, the South and the American Union, with the contribution of the South. And he concludes by saying, look, there will come a time when, when the Union, when America is going to need the South and the Southern worldview. They're going to need it. And America has always needed it. This is something that people don't realize. America has always needed the South as a counterweight to this nastiness from Puritan New England. Because the, the thing that people don't like about America is Puritanism. They don't like it. They don't like Puritan New England. It's what they don't get. They don't want the cultural imperialism. That's what creates all the problems from the center. We've got nationalism, which is now, if you, it's, it's one side or the other trying to enforce their will on everybody else. That's, that's Yankeeism. That's all that is. 
It's Yankees being Yankees, and it's what we don't like about Yankees and what we don't like about America. What we do like about America is the individualistic part, the rugged individualism. Leave us alone. Sweep around your own back door. This is what we do like about America. It's what we've always liked about America. It's when the South was America, and I will still say the South is America in a lot of ways. That's what we really enjoy about America. The ability to leave each other alone. And decentralization, as we've talked about in this podcast many, 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 many times, decentralization is the only way to do that. It's Calhoun. It's Jefferson. It's a Southern political tradition, but not just that. We have to look at the cultural part of it, too. What does it mean to be Southern? What does it mean to be Northern? And you had these two incompatible things already in North America in the 17th century, and how do they get along? Well, you had a union of delegated powers that could only exercise those delegated powers. That's how you get along. You don't try to force your will on one section or one state or the other. You try to just have commerce and defense, and hey, if we're attacked, we'll get together and say, we'll defend you, and you defend us, and we're good to go. Otherwise, leave us alone. But you can't do that if you have a, a Yankee mindset that everything has to be reformed and changed. And the piece on, on Tuesday gets into that when it comes down to the churches. You see, this is born out of reformed churches in New England. This this uh, very much a crusading Yankee mindset was born out of that. And so I love that piece on Tuesday. But there's so many other things that this affects. I mean, uh, this this uh, this idea that we have to reform and remake everything. When, when Barack Obama stood up in 2009 and gave his inaugural address and said, we're going to continue the process of remaking America. Essentially, he's he's going back to the statements that were made right after the war was over and saying, we're going to remake America. We're going to continue the pro- process of remaking America. It's, it's, we're looking at the, the founding. This is when people say, you know, I, was, I love my country. For the first time in my life, I'm proud of my country. It's Michelle Obama. Because they have a view of America in their head that doesn't mesh with reality. It's, it's Henry David Thoreau. It's Walden. The America they love is not the America in which they live. It's an ideal America that doesn't exist. And until they get to that ideal America, they're going to try to reform and change and make everything over and make everything in their image to make it fit to what they want it to be. And Richard Weaver does such a nice job of pointing out the Yankee mindset in this essay and how the South fits with that and what the Southern man actually is. And so I I highly recommend you read Richard Weaver. If you haven't read Richard Weaver, you need to. You need to read the man. He is, he is essential reading for understanding the South and the Southern tradition. And um, too many of our folks don't read them. So going out, I would recommend getting uh, the, the Southern essays of Richard Weaver. It's a great introduction to Weaver's thought. And I think this essay is actually published in there as well. It's a great introduction to Richard Weaver and his thought. Um, and then, of course, you can get defensive tradition. There's, uh, Weaver was a great essayist, I think, is, is the important thing to point out with Weaver. He wrote great essays. And so he was, he was excellent at, at, getting, at condensing his thoughts into a short, punchy piece. And I think that's something, again, it's Spartan. It's being able to do that. It's a, it's a skill. It's the classical man. You don't have to write an entire book to extrapolate and expand on uh, what you think about tradition. You can write essays, and you can punch people with them, and it works better. So... If you are someone out there, learn how to write. Learn you have you have to you have to expand some thoughts and explain some things, but learn how to write in a way that gets to the heart of the issue, hits people with it, and you move on. Because we got other things to do in the South than worry about trying to uh, uh, convince everyone of our uh, righteousness, right? Uh, so the piece on Tuesday, I think it's a wonderful piece too. It's a book review. Um, it's a tale of two churches. And uh, it's written by Garrick, Garrett Agajanian. And uh, Garrett Agajanian is a, I hope I'm saying that right, Garrett Agajanian. He, is a, um, he has a bachelor's degree in theology. Um, and he wrote this, it's a, it's a book entitled Sacred Conviction, the South Stand for Biblical Authority. It's published by Shotwell uh, just last year. Uh, it's written by, the book is written by John Jay. But he points out that the church was driving, particularly, there's, there's, two, there's two types of churches. There's the Southern Church, which he uh, explains with some of the churches in Charleston and Columbia, South Carolina. And then there's the Northern Church, which was leading this crusading zeal 
to remake America. And that's because they lost their way from the traditional part of the church. He brings up, look, there's a, there's a reason why we had awakenings that started in New England. Because New England had lost their way. They had lost the attachment to the church. And so they had these awakenings to try to revitalize that. And he points out a lot of the people who were leading the great sermons, the great the Great Awakening sermons, you had the first and the second, of course, were actually Anglicans from, from England itself, not from New England, who were doing this. There were some, of course, natives uh, to the area, New England and other, who, who, were, who were trying to lead these, these awakenings. But a lot of these people were transplants. They came over here and they're trying to lead these awakenings. And so uh, he points out that the church, this biblical worldview was important, North and South, and the way that the South looked at the Bible was different from the North. The way that the church handled things was different in the South than in the North. So the Southern mind was not just something that had to do with, again, uh, surface factors, climate, geography, labor, whatever. The Southern mind was deeper than that. It was a philosophical predisposition. It was a theological predisposition. It was how it was culture. It was how you were reared that mattered. And that, of course, would then filter into political culture. What's amazing to me about that political culture, there's a part of North Carolina that's always been very much uh, interested in decentralization. I mean, a lot of the great uh, leaders who are decentralist leaders from North Carolina came from this one little part of North Carolina, and that's because of the culture of the area. And so uh, you have that part of the state that's interested in these political ideas of decentralization and local autonomy and local authority. It's culture. It's not because they've been out there reading some uh, political philosophers. It's just because of who they are. As Mel Bradford said, remember who we are. It's important to get that. Remember who we are. And so I think this, uh, this little essay is, is wonderful uh, in this review of this book and looking at the difference between the North and the Southern churches. I mean, we could, do, we could have this exercise all day. What is the difference between the North and the South? I mean, you, I mean, you, could, write, you could write volumes on this. And what was the Union supposed to do? You had these two sections that were dramatically different. Without question, they were different. Culturally, they were different. They might have all been English, but as, as again, as Fisher points out, I mean, these, play, these people are different. So you have these differences, and that's fine. The differences can coexist. But the coexistence has to begin with an acceptance that we have a union for delegated, enumerated purposes and nothing else, and you have to leave each section alone. And when you don't, this is something that John Taylor of Caroline even worried about. He said, I'm worried that the South is dominating New England too much at one point. They're, gonna get, they're getting restless about it. New England nationalism is really New England sectionalism. They're getting restless about it, and they're going to cause problems because if they get a hold of the government, they're going to impose their will on us. And that's exactly what happened. So we need a union that won't allow any of that to happen. It won't allow for cultural or political or economic imposition. You have to be able to get along in the union. This is why, you know, we've said, look, if California wants to go, let California go. If California wants to have an independent state, let California do what California wants to do. Just don't tell the South how to live. And, and the South shouldn't tell California how to live. And New England shouldn't tell the Midwest how to live. And the Midwest shouldn't tell the South. And the South shouldn't tell New England. And New England shouldn't tell the South. We have this union for a delegated specific purposes. And if we have that, then... All these different areas, this is what the agrarians are pointing out. We have regional government. We have regional things. This is what makes America great. It's what makes America strong because you have these different things that bring different things to the table, and they can do that. And so uh, we had a piece on Thursday, uh, Copperhead Loves the South. Um, it's written by uh, John Idesmore, who is a, uh, a retired colonel from the uh, United States Air Force, and he's from South Dakota, and he wrote this Confederate Memorial Day address and delivered it in Montgomery. Uh, it's great because he points out, hey, look, these are the things I love about the South, and he, and he, and he highlights them. What is it I love about the South? And he lists a number of them. He says, I love neighbors waving as I drive by. I love saying good morning to strangers on the street. I love the way Southerners treasure their families. I love the way Southerners value their land, not just for its economic value, but because land is an extension of our identity. I love the Southern acceptance of human fallibility. 
with a skepticism of big government and centralized power as a solution for all our problems. I love Southern respect for tradition. I love the story Richard Weaver tells of the cousins driving together across Kentucky. There's Weaver again. I love the way Southerners are not afraid to be out of fashion in their politics, their dress, their speech, and their lifestyles. And I love the way Southerners can laugh at themselves. I also love Southerners' unabashed patriotism. And what I love most is that the Southerners who are Christians are unafraid to talk openly about their faith. So, these are things about culture. He's from New North North Dakota, or I'm sorry, South Dakota, excuse me, South Dakota. I don't want to tell you something. He's from South Dakota, and yet he loves the South. He moved down here and he says, I love this place. He's a copperhead because he sees value in the Southern tradition. He sees value in what the South offers to America. There's value in it. And of course, this is something that uh, Phil Lee points out on Friday, Sins and Virtues of Civil War History. People don't see value in it. They don't understand the complexity of the South. They just want to bash the South for whatever reason, and they don't see the diversity, in fact, in the South. As Southerners were complex people, and that all these, these uh, slanders that are, that are these ad hominem attacks on the South are, are used because people don't really understand the South. And he brings up Frank Hammer. Uh, if you've seen the uh, the Netflix show uh, High Women, which has uh, Kevin Costner and Woody Harrelson, it's about the the uh, the effort to get Bonnie and Clyde. And Frank Hammer was a Texas Ranger who goes out and and he's one of the ones who pulls the trigger to kill Bonnie and Clyde. But um, he talks about how you know there's diversity even in the South. That someone like Atticus Finch was a real Southern to a lot of people because these people existed. And of course, the the follow up to to the Kill a Mockingbird was Atticus Finch being. Uh, and people didn't like that follow-up because it, <laughs> Atticus Finch was not in their mind what they thought Atticus Finch should be. But regardless, you had these you have these uh, images of the South that just don't mesh with reality. Um, you had a lot of Southern moderates out there. You had a lot of people that were just, uh, I mean, again, sweeping around their own back door. They're just trying to get along and go along and just live. And what I like about the last piece of the week, and it was published on Wednesday, Bluegrass and Jazz, what do they have in common? Tom Daniel, who is, uh, has t- spoken about this topic of you know, Southern moderates and, uh, and, and very well, he's, he's done a great job with that, talks about how bluegrass and jazz, though seemingly incompatible, are really the same thing because they are a way of looking at music that's technical and it's great musicianship. I mean, these people really know how to play their instruments. And would bluegrass and jazz players be able to play on the same stage? He says, absolutely. They may not, they may not play the same style, but they would respect the ability to play their instruments. And this is something that Tom really gets into. It's reconciliation, as Dr. Daniel gets into reconciliation through music and how Southern music is such a reconciliationist thing, how music brings Southerners together of all races and backgrounds, and American music is Southern music. And so and to have it, to have that, that history, that musical history is so important for the South and Southern culture in the Southern tradition. And it's why, I, I mean, we like to publish these pieces on Southern music because they mean something for the Southern tradition. They mean something for the Southern people. So um, when we're thinking about Southern music and Southern society and Southern culture and what the South is, the Southern mind, music is an expression of that mind. Music is an expression of those people, of the Southern people. Even today, it's an expression of, of the Southern people. You may not like all the music, I mean, but you can appreciate the music for what it does and how it represents the South. And I think even you know Weaver and others would, would point this out. Um, the, the Southern composers, classical composers, uh, one of our authors, Boyd Cathy, is, is uh, very interested in Southern music, Southern classical music. Those Southern classical composers, people like John Powell, for example, um, who is now vilified because of uh, because his views, but his music is excellent. Uh, but he brought in a, um, a a traditionalist view in terms of folk tales into into his music. He's from Virginia, and um, th- that that part of it you can you can detach the things from you can detach that beautiful part of it. We, we as I said, every tradition has its thorns, so we need to respect what's true and valuable. And, and that musical tradition, regard, I mean, it, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And so the mind, the mind creates the music. The culture creates the music. The music doesn't create the culture. The culture creates the literature. The literature doesn't create the culture. The culture creates the, the political views. They don't create the, the culture. The political views don't do that. Southern society was a creation of the mind and the church 
And, and I think that's one thing I want you to get out of this week. Read this essay by Richard Weaver and then go and read more Weaver um, because I think it's so important to understand that book by John Jay uh, is wonderful as well. So get out there and read that material and really understand that Southern mind and Southern culture. It's essential for understanding the Southerner and what the Southerner's role in society. Until next time, good day. Good day.